Welcome to Roadshow News Recap. What is going on with Lordstown Motors? That is our big story of the week. And Sean, what's the scoop? Yeah, I'm fresh from Lordstown, Ohio, the oasis of Lordstown, Ohio, and it was uh, quite an experience, Craig. Well, we'll get into that a little bit later in the show. Plus, we've got to talk about the 2022 Honda Civic Hatchback, which I actually saw in person, so there's a lot to say about that car. There's a new Infiniti QX60 you guys need to know about. The Toyota released another Tundra teaser that you have got to see to believe. And, of course, there is a whole lot more to talk about in this show, including the results of our weekly social media poll. So we will get to all of that and a whole lot more. But first, I've got to say, happy Friday, everyone. It's great to be back. And Sean, of course, it's great to have you back. I hope you found those mud flaps you were looking for. I didn't find the mud flaps, but that's okay. I'm back, refreshed, just took some time off. And uh, here I am, back and ready to roll with you. Did you check out eBay or or no? What's eBay? (laughs) Oh, come on. You got to get your Yosemite Sam mud flaps. Well, I'll have to keep checking the Goodwill stores around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, good luck on the hunt. Uh, of course, if you are joining us live right now, make sure you drop your questions or comments in the chat box. We will check those as the show goes on and try our best to respond and answer your, to your comments and uh, respond to your questions. Uh, and remember that you can check Roadshow News Recap out every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern right here on the Roadshow YouTube channel or even on Facebook or Twitch. But our main story of the week is all about Lordstown Motors, that sort of startup company that's looking to build an all-electric pickup. Like, they're one of how many companies building electric trucks now? I can't even remember. But, Sean, they had a media event earlier in the week. You were there. What is the story and what are your impressions from Lordstown Motors. Yeah. Uh, did you hear that sigh? It was like a, <laughs> that sigh says it uh, all, folks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, they did. They invited a handful of media. I believe they were calling this uh, Lordstown Week. Um, and the event was an experience. Um, yeah, there, there there was a lot going on, and, and and I'm not trying to be you know like sarcastic about it. You know, this company from the employees that you know I, I spoke to met and gave some presentations. It seems like a lot of them are genuinely working very very hard to take this former General Motors plant and uh, you know flip the lights back on and and bring local manufacturing back to the area. Uh, really, the overall impression and takeaway is that that just kind of remains to be seen at this point because, you know, there's been a string of some pretty bad financial news. Uh, some executives departed. We'll talk about a little bit about that. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was an experience for sure. So what they're trying to do, uh, the Lordstown plant in Lordstown, Ohio, which is, what is that east of Cleveland where you're at? Yeah, it's east. It's about a little over an hour straight shot down uh, the turnpike, which is Interstate 80 for (laughs) non-Ohioans. So go down the turnpike. But massive factory, if I remember from your story that went live on the roadshow.com this week, what is it, like six plus million square feet? Something like that. Yeah, it it is ginormous. And this is a facility that opened, you know, in like auto manufacturing prime time heyday in the 60s. You know, so it built some of the most popular, best-selling GM cars. You know, we're talking like, you know, not that all of them were good cars, but we're talking things like Cavalier (laughs) and stuff like that. You know, not great cars, but you know what? They sold hundreds of thousands of them at at one point. So this is a massive facility. There's an Mm on-site paint shop, 6.2 million square feet. And uh, overall, Lordstown, they didn't give us an exact figure, but kind of eyeballing it through our tour. They're probably only using like 10% of this place. It's it's such a tiny operation right now. It felt kind of lonesome in there. I, I can imagine because if you've ever been in an automotive manufacturing plant, they're pretty big. Usually they're pr- a pretty good size. And when you have a startup that's not actually manufacturing anything saleable yet, like you don't need all of that room, not even close. Um 
But of course, the pickup that we've been showing you, the vehicle of the hour, so to speak, is the, the Lordstown Endurance, right? This is their all-electric pickup truck. Uh, I believe they debuted it last year. It's supposed to have uh, in-wheel hub motors. And then, of course, it will compete with like an F-150 Lightning or the upcoming Hummer. There's the Cybertruck and, of course, the Rivian R1T. But uh, it doesn't sound like they're really ready for prime time yet because they're not manufacturing them per se are they sean no they aren't uh so the the lowdown on the manufacturing side of things is uh according to the sole executive who kind of accompanied us on our tour uh the chief engineer uh they built 60 uh beta trucks and uh uh, a few of them were outside, as you see here in the photos, and these were for ride-along purposes uh, for the media. We weren't allowed to drive them or check them out too closely. Um, and then uh, I believe nine of them went to the federal government for crash testing and federal motor vehicle safety standards, stuff like that, uh, which they say the truck passed with flying colors. Uh, so that's good. Uh, but yeah, the the you know aside from the plant tour that we had this was a chance for us to get up close and personal with this truck that i mean the entire company's banking on this truck and you know it at first here's the thing with lordstown when they first you know uh popped into existence uh everyone was like whoa they're buying a gm plant you know it was it's a great plant it's a rather modern facility you know it has you know some sustainable energy a huge array of solar panels outside pretty fresh stamps you know for uh you know the panels robotics etc you know it's not a dinky place this just built like a chevy cruise a couple years ago it's, it's rather modern so it felt like mm -hmm. wow they feel like they got a, they got a leg up you know they have a modern facility they could really utilize the stuff and make it come together Building cars is hard <laughs> for people who've never built a car before. I think that's something that gets overlooked in today's industry. You know, you're talking GM, Ford, Chrysler, even, you know, like Toyota, Honda, and now even Hyundai and Kia. They've built cars for decades, if not 100 years at this point. They have it down to a pat. So yep. it, part, of the, part of the financial uh, troubles come from... These things take a lot more money than perhaps you first expect to build a quality the, vehicle. The only way to make a small fortune in the car business is to start with a larger fortune because of just the costs involved. I mean, you think about the engineering it takes to to create a vehicle, but it's not just that. You have to meet fuel economy standards. There are crash standards. There are, I mean, f federal motor vehicle safety standards are the hundreds of them that you have to meet for like the headlight design and or the way the safety restraints work, all that stuff. Uh, and then you've got to coordinate with outside companies, all of your supply base to bring the 15, 20, 30,000 parts it takes to build a new vehicle all together at the right time with good quality that's going to last for the, you know, at least a decade. And then you have to assemble it so it stays together and then sell it to people and then they have to buy it and hopefully it stays together. So your warranty costs aren't through the roof. There's so many levels and layers to it that I would never ever want to start a car company. <laughs> I would. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, to, to their credit, you know, their executive team who they didn't make available for questions to the media. Um, but I mean, if, if they are truly trying and they want to see this company succeed, then hats off to them because that's quite a venture. Uh, yeah. you know, it, you know, we'll talk about something a little bit later that they're now ex CEO and CFO. It seems like they were doing, you know, some questionable things. Uh, but yeah. I mean, back to the, back to the truck, you know, I had yes. a pretty brief, pretty brief ride along in it. I mean, it, it wasn't bad. You know, I, I went in, you know, kind of expecting it to feel like an electric vehicle. I've driven electric vehicles and this felt like an electric pickup truck. Uh, you know, it, yeah you know, scoots really quickly, the instantaneous torque, uh, according to my driver and the company, these uh, beta vehicles that we got to ride in, uh, the in-wheel hub motors were functional, power came from their uh, uh, in-house battery facility where they build their own battery packs and those are filled with um, LG and Samsung cells, are their suppliers for that, they say. Um, okay. And over and overall, it felt like a, a you know, a beta pre-production truck, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to knock them for, you know, it kind of felt jiggly and things weren't, you know, super tight, but like you get in any beta pre-production vehicle and things kind of feel yeah. like that anyway. So, yeah. 
Uh, in the YouTube chat, George says Lordstown was an elaborate scam. <laughs> that might be a bit harsh, <laughs> but uh, given some of the recent news, uh, yeah, which we'll get to in just a second, I can't necessarily refute that claim. <laughs> and then Steve yeah, Kane yeah. says, I'm originally from Youngstown area. Hope this isn't just another failed business. And yeah, I hope I hope it succeeds as well because, uh, you know, when you have a smallish town like Lordstown and the major employer is General Motors, like most of the people work there, um, and then the, the company decides to pull out, it's just absolutely devastating. I mean, something very similar happened in Flint, Michigan, you know, back in the 80s when they outsourced the manufacturing from there. And Flint is still like smoldering, like it's a, a ghost town compared to its former glory. Even today, like 30, almost 40 years later, it's it's crazy. So yeah, I hope that uh, Lordstown Motors can succeed and, and, and keep the lights on and keep people employed, but I don't know if that's possible without yeah, way it, more money. It, it, it just, yeah, you know, the the, the interim CEO and uh, uh, chairman, uh, she gave very brief remarks when we first got there. And I mean, she was blunt and, and felt, you know, like she was saying, honestly, like we, we need more capital, uh, you know, and they signaled that in their financial report that there may not be enough money in the bank to put the truck into production. I mean, that's what you, you know, need to do <laughs> if you want to start yeah. to recoup you know, your losses that you need to sell something, you know, that, that, that's, that's yeah. business 101. And if you've spent all of this money and you can't build what you said you were going to build, you know, then that's where real trouble, uh, comes. But, uh, in terms yeah. of the uh, fellow Ohioan who just commented there, um, I didn't catch your username. Uh, Craig and I were speaking the other day and, uh, you know, it's, Lordstown, I hope doesn't feel like just another one of those stories across the U S where, you know, it's, there's an anchor, it's gone. I mean, it, it was just, it was kind of breathtaking to be inside of this facility that GM left everything. There were the break tables still there with microwaves and the soap dispenser is still filled with, you know, Zep hand scrub and the locker rooms, you know, punch clocks. It's like, you could imagine this, you know, workforce of three shifts just humming mm -hmm. along. And now it's just, it was just incredible to see. And, you know, for as, you know, cynical as we may need to speak about it because things don't look good for Lordstown, you know, you hope for a company to do well. So something like that can return. Yeah, exactly. And it ain't going to be easy, not just on the financial side, but from a competitive standpoint as well, because like I mentioned a minute ago, Rivian R1T, uh, F-150 Lightning, if that's not like the segment leader upon arrival, I don't know what else will be. Uh, Hummer is coming out. Of course, Cybertruck. This is, there isn't really an electric truck segment right now, but it's going to be pretty viable, a pretty, pretty well stocked in the not too distant future. And if Lordstown doesn't get its act together, it's going to completely miss out on everything. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, question yeah, in the absolutely. YouTube chat from. Uh, from G Gerg Hurlg, G R G H L G. Does Lordstown have any other products coming soon? What can you tell us, Sean? As far as I know, it's only the endurance, but did they talk about anything else? Well, a while ago, their now ex CEO, Steve Burns, spoke of plans for like a, uh, I, I believe it was like an SUV um, based on the endurance. And the company is using a skateboard chassis, which we did get to see in the battery packs in there. And then, you know, like a, a body on frame vehicle, you plop the body onto the chassis, uh, you know, the, the, that's that. So you just change the body and you can have multiple products uh, pretty easily. But at this tour, they made it very clear they are laser focused on trying to get the endurance out the door first, uh, though they mm -hmm. were very comfortable reiterating that there was a lot of value in the 6.2 million square feet that they currently occupy in case they do produce new products. So it's, it's a wait wink and see, nod, but right now yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a wait and see, you know, you know, they should really be worried about getting their first truck out the door first. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, Mao Zedong in the chat says having the electric motors on the wheels is already, in my opinion, a great start when it comes to the management of the available space. From then on, it's just a matter of improving a lot. And I think that's a very uh, astute observation. You push 
you push those motors out to each of the wheels, suddenly you've got a lot more space for a battery, right? I think that's what Lordstown was talking about with the endurance. They could fit larger battery packs in the truck. But the question I have is with those wheel hub motors, you're going to have a lot more unsprung mass. And unsprung mass is never a good thing in a vehicle. So I guess, I mean, it's a trade-off. And I guess with suspension tuning and other things, they can probably make it work pretty well. But I would be concerned about the ride and handling of the vehicle. But yeah, I of gotta course, say, we'll have to wait I, and see I, until we can drive one. Yeah. And I got to say, uh, after the ride along, I asked uh, one of the engineers, I, I said, so like, how are you counteracting that? And they, the basic answer really came down to was they tuned the suspension like crazy and they were surprised at the results that they got and they kept it. Um, I will say that the in-wheel motor that they are using on the beta trucks, they actually plan for it to be a little bit, uh, wider actually to increase torque. Uh, that's what I was Hmm. told. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, definitely an interesting setup. Um, I would be curious to see if that's a more expensive setup rather than, you know, some sort of off the shelf, uh, you know, set uh a setup from bosch or something like that i know there's some mm-hmm. companies that'll just like sell you that and then you just kind of do what you need to yeah. do with it um but i did find out that these, industry yeah. right yeah but these these in wheel hub motors also everybody are not an lmc design uh that's something that they did tell us as well it's actually from a slovenian company and they purchased the rights to use them uh so i guess it is an off the shelf k- kind of uh ordeal but uh, curious why they would go that route if, uh, if maybe there are some cheaper solutions. But then again, I don't know. I'm not in their finance books, nor do I want to be. Yeah, that would be no, – math is hard. Math is really hard. <laughs> so yeah. we don't we use math. We don't use numbers. We use words. Um, mm-hmm. Also, that with if you go with an in-wheel hub motor, I imagine you can get rid of the, the drive shafts that you would normally have running from a centrally, you know, on each axle mounted motor. Uh, that would run the wheels. So maybe there's a benefit there. Um, but during the presentation, it, it's doubt, it sounds like it's doubtful Lordstown has enough money to even remain, what, a, a going concern through 2021? And that's a pretty big problem. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really big problem. Like I said, they were pretty flat out and said, we're looking for more capital. We're looking to find new sources of investment. Uh, that's ongoing while we were at the plant and they kind of had their pom poms out and cheering about the truck. Um, and they also said like joint ventures and stuff like that are not off the table. If, if a company wanted to be like, Hey, you know, like we'll share the cost with you, you know, and we can help you get your truck out the door, but you know, you scratch my back, scratch yours kind of deal. So, I mean, really who knows they were insistent that the first trucks will roll down that assembly line in late September it was just very concerning and there was a bit of a juxtaposition because they said like all the dyes were arriving the same month production starts and the part of the factory where in wheel, the in wheel hub motor production will take place. That manufacturing equipment is still not in the United States and uh, sitting, I forget in what country the engineer said, and it's supposed to arrive in August. That's not a lot of time to to get everything together in September. Yeah, That's, no, yeah. like stamping dies weigh tons and tons. You don't just pick them up and move them like you do your kitchen table with a couple guys. You know, you shuffle it off to the side <laughs> or something. Like, no, this is this is serious metal bashing equipment, and you don't just yeah. <laughs> if yeah, it's, it's coming not, the month before, the, like that, I don't see how that's feasible. It, Yeah. It's not like when your aunt calls you and she's like, Hey, can you come over and move this? Because you know, I can't do it. It's like, no, no, like that's a job in itself. And I'm sure hiring contractors or somebody, they put it where it needs to be. And, you know, again, building cars is really hard. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Tony in the chat says great write up and tour of Lordstown facility on the roadshow website by Sean Simkowski. Yes, I would agree. Awesome little story, Sean. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I really wanted to put people inside there because number one, a lot of people don't even get to go inside of a production facility. Granted, this is a startup, but again, this was a facility that built hundreds of thousands of cars in its prime. So I kind of wanted to make it feel like you were there, like look through my eyes. So I'm glad you appreciated it. 
Yeah, and if you haven't read his story yet, everyone that's watching live or the recorded version of this show, check it out over at theroadshow.com. Great write-up by Sean. Um, <clears throat> some controversy, though. So L Lordstown Motors sounds like they're going to run out of money before the end of the year. But then a couple of their executives sold a bunch of stock. What was it? Earlier in the year? And, I mean, you can't really just do that. <laughs> I think it was the CEO Ooh, yeah, and that, CFO it's... have now resigned from all this controversy. Like, come on, you're supposed yeah. to be smarter than that. You're running a damn company. You know better. Yeah. <laughs> Whether there was it's clearly or no... not, the optics of it are terrible. Yeah, there was clearly like... no mention of that while I was there, and they refused to speak to that. And I get that. That's PR 101, <laughs> uh, is that yeah, you're not right? going to talk about it. You know, we're focused on yeah. what's happening here today in the future. Ugh, excellent PR. That was wonderful. Good on them that no one slipped up on that. Anyway, yeah. yes, terrible optics. And so the story goes, uh, the CEO and CFO unloaded a lot of stock just before their financial report was coming out because Lordstown is a public company. They went public via IPO and a, 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 a SPAC, a SPAC, whatever you want to call it, um, and that's when no they said we're not doing so means, hot. But... Uh, special purpose yeah. acquisition company, blank check company. There, there's lots of weird terms for it these huh. days, but uh, it basically gets to bypass a lot of IPO scrutiny is, is what I understand. Someone could correct me gotcha. if I'm uh, not totally right on that. But um, uh, yeah, they unloaded a lot of stock. The financial report came out. It wasn't so good. And they were also forced to clarify they have zero, zero binding orders for their truck and they previously said they had thousands of pre-orders for this endurance pickup and well, there's a pre-order and there's a binding <laughs> order i imagine right because yes, anybody can yeah. plunk down a hundred dollars to reserve a cyber truck or something it doesn't mean they're gonna buy it when it's available <laughs> it sure makes right. for an impressive number when you <laughs> right when when you have your pr team trumpeting that oh we have a yeah. ten thousand reservations or whatever wow that's cool but you haven't necessarily sold any, so. <laughs> yeah, so it really is. This is why we wanted to talk about it this week, because it was just a cornucopia. I don't know if there's a better word for it, of just yeah. strange vibes. It was very much like things are not going well, but let's pretend things are going well, you know? Yes, so. put on a happy face. <laughs> Smile. Yeah. Uh, DB409 writes in the chat, even if they get enough money to go to production, there's no way they can sell it competitively and still make a profit. The best they could hope is to sell their technology, but does anybody want it? And at, at very valid points because That's everyone else is also developing point. electric trucks, right? They're yeah, not the only it's a really great point. But uh, the, then, my counter, just my counter that really quick is sure. I don't know what proprietary technology they do have because the in-wheel hub motors aren't theirs that anyone could go buy those if they wanted to build a pickup truck similar. Um, I'm not, mm -hmm. they didn't talk super in depth about the battery, you know, if something special is going on there, but those cells are LG and Samsung. They flat out told us. So that's also open for anybody to purchase who wants to build a car. Yeah. And another thing, I, I haven't heard anything about this, but you look at the Lordstown Endurance truck, it looks exactly like a GM, like T900 pickup, the previous generation, you know, Silverado or Sierra, the door handles, the, uh, the, the side glass, the sort of shape of the belt line. It all looks to my eye, at least exactly like one of those GM trucks. And I'm just wondering if they got like a fire sale pricing on leftover GM components or the, or the, manufacturing equipment and that's what they base this truck on i'm not entirely sure but because i haven't heard anything about that but i would bet this is it's got a lot in common with an older gm pickup did they say anything yeah John? yeah i didn't notice that actually until you craig earlier this week kind of did a side by side of uh you know an older silverado and the endurance and i was like oh yeah you're right like it kind of does have that same shape they didn't mention anything about it sharing those kinds of bones with an older GM truck. It wouldn't surprise me, but yeah. I will tell you there was a lot of GM switch gear inside the truck. We rode in the back seats. We couldn't go in the front seat, um, but you know, obviously, I, I could take pictures and you know could see everything that was going on. Uh, the climate you could controls, take some pictures, some pictures. Yes, if anyone does yeah. want to read 
uh, the write up on the roadshow.com. The phrase of the day was cameras down, please. Uh, there was a lot they didn't want photos of going out there, but um, a lot of the switch gear in this and truck. Why invite the media straight out of GM? <laughs> right. In fact, the uh, the power on button comes from a Chevy Bolt, B O L T. Uh, it's identical. Wow. So there's got to be some more GM commonality there. Absolutely. I'm sure. Mao says, I think this company will go bankrupt because it doesn't stand out much. Again, another very valid point because, again, everybody's doing electric trucks and this one doesn't have the um, controversial styling of a cyber truck or, you know, the solid reputation and low price of like the F-150 Lightning that's coming out. So where, do, where does it stand? I don't know. But um, yeah. So what else is there to share, Sean? It was quite uh, the eventful little media event, if that makes sense. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really was. Um, just a, a weird little nugget I noticed is they were carting us around on these golf carts uh, to different various portions of the, the plant. There was, they, they showed us the paint shop. We couldn't go inside. Uh, I, I don't know if it's legitimate. I don't paint vehicles, but they said for contamination purposes, we're not suited up to be in a sterile environment, et cetera. You know, showed us the paint colors they plan on doing. Uh, but at, at every time you got back in your golf cart and someone was driving you, they had a Bluetooth speaker in there and there was someone narrating what you were seeing. And I forgot to ask but I'm almost positive it was their now ex-CEO, Steve Burns, <laughs> telling us about the plants. <laughs> I did a phone oh. interview with Steve Burns about a year ago, so the voice, uh, I'm pretty sure, was Steve Burns. <laughs> That's crazy. Crazy. The former CEO, uh, insider trading, yada, yada, not there anymore, pre-recorded, <laughs> and now he's gone. Oh, uh, lovely. Yeah. Yes, but uh, it was truly a wild ride. <laughs> um, th th and really, it was they tried to show off what they wanted to do. Uh, you know, they did have some of they say they have 450 employees there, uh, engineers and uh, assembly line workers. Uh, you know, they kind of showed us putting some of the truck parts together on demonstration vehicles. Uh, they showed off some of the robots, even though a lot of the robots, as we were tooling around uh they were kind of just like zipping up and down doing nothing it kind of looked more like mm -hmm. make them look like they're doing something uh, uh but uh yeah it was yeah truly a wild ride and uh the last thing they had us do is they showed off this uh military vehicle kind of side project is what they called it um and it was basically like an endurance no not basically it was an endurance with the uh <laughs> the roof gone and three rows of seats and uh, you could go for a ride in that if you wanted. Uh, I declined because they call it a were... military vehicle. Yeah, they said they showed it to the U.S. Army, and the quote I got back—I cannot rem remember the gentleman's name—said they got generally positive feedback from it. Uh, but it sounds like it was just a side project, meaningless. Which, in my head, I questioned. I said, if y'all are in some financial trouble, I wouldn't be going and doing side projects. I'd be worried about your your pickup truck. <laughs> Your bread and butter, exactly. Because the, yeah. the, the military truck had no roof, and it was like a roll cage sort of structure, which is like a sport side-by-side, -side, not a Humvee that I would actually want to ride in in battle. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's I, exposed. I, You're going to get shot at. Like, <laughs> I I don't know. I, I wasn't there to judge the uh, design or engineering of it. It was a kind of a strange design, I thought, for a military vehicle, but yeah. I don't know. You know, if the U.S. Army did see it and perhaps they did like it for maybe just transport, you know, outside of conflict zone. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So if you are watching live right now, make sure you drop your questions or comments in the chat room. We will answer those as best we can as the show goes on. But uh, yeah, Lordstown Motors, quite the story. It's a I guess we could call it an evolving story. We'll have to keep an eye on this going forward because if their financials are, you know, indeed accurate, they may not be around before the end of the year, <laughs> which is unfortunate. We don't want to see that happen necessarily, but uh, that's the reality of life in the, in the automotive business these days. So, yep. yeah, but uh, sounds like you had a good time, Sean. Excellent reporting as always. Check out Sean's story over on theroadshow.com. Uh, we also, of course, uh, to involve you guys, we, we posed the question, uh, a couple questions to you guys on, 
on social media to find out what your take is on Lordstown Motors. And Evan, if you've got those handy, what are the results of this week's poll? Let's see what we have here. So we had uh, Endurance versus the Cybertruck. Holy cow. This is like almost a 50-50 split. Yeah. Huh. F I wouldn't expect that. Yeah, it's crazy. Given the amount of buzz around the Cybertruck and it's 51% in favor of the Endurance? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't what? know. What? Hey, everyone can have their own opinions. But yeah, you all need to go to Roadshow Auto's <laughs> Instagram handle and vote. So if you're just like, yes. what the heck? Well, you have to vote. Yeah. So go vote next week. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely, because we do. We try to do these every week, um, and there are a couple more, couple, couple, couple more uh, pages to that poll, if I recall. So yes, here we go. What is this one? Lightning uh, versus endurance. Well, there we go. That's a that's a more expected result. Eighty twenty yes. split in favor of the yeah. lightning, which is confirmed is not vaporware. It's going into production and it's priced at about forty grand for the start. Uh, so yeah, and what was the last one then, Evan? Lords is Lordstown Motors DOA dead on arrival. Um, Sixty-seven percent said yes. Thirty-three percent said no. So, some yeah, it's uh, it's, yeah, it's not uh, what I would have expected. Going to be a waiting game. Yeah. The big cat says Cybertruck is hideous. <laughs> I can't disagree. <laughs> yeah, it's not my thing which... either. Uh, oh, over here yeah. on Facebook, we had. Uh, Janie Joseph say that's ugly referring to the endurance. So, <laughs> Oh, really? To each their own though, to each their own. Yes. We've got some folks in the YouTube chat here. Uh, Tony says endurance actually looks like a truck though. He prefers the lightning. Uh, then Arthur wall says lightning is perfect for truck people because as we talked about on another show, it's basically an F one fifty. So you get all the benefits of that along with a very nice electric powertrain. So there yes, you go. Yes, but uh but Craig, we can uh shift yes. gears because we're gonna talk about a car that definitely will be going into production and they're gonna make hundreds of thousands of them because it's a Honda Civic. <laughs> yes, it is. 100%. Yes, it's the Civic hatchback, which you saw this uh previously in person and uh did a video yes. on for our YouTube channel, so everyone can watch that as well. Uh, but yeah, this debuted this week. Uh, this is the 2022 model year. So this follows the newly uh, redesigned sedan. Uh, and the design is much smoother. I would say more mature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think looks like a, a Renault. <laughs> uh, but I haven't Craig, noticed you should that, tell them that, yeah. that, that, that you, you should tell them that the fact I think it looks like a Renault may have some credence. Yes, because uh, supposedly designers of the new Civic Hatch were inspired by European liftback models. So like an Audi, say, A5 Sportback or something um, with that very uh, tapering roof line, which gives the car, it, in my opinion, more of a coupe-like profile than a hatchback. Because to me, a hatchback is like a Volkswagen Golf or a GTI. It's squared off. It's boxy. Uh, maximum func functionality, right? You get as much space inside mm -hmm. as you can for hauling stuff. And this is much more graceful. And I've got to say, it looks very nice. Uh, they did a very nice job, uh, of course, with the Civic sedan. And then this is an offshoot of that. You can see a nice shot of it there, the rear three-quarter. Um, up front as well, you get a different grill from the new sedan. So it's got a mesh texture to it uh, instead of what the sedan is fitted with. And then it's a little bit concave as well. So a slight, uh, very minor way of telling them apart. Uh, but mm. one of the biggest mechanical differences is the uh, the hatchback is nearly five inches shorter than the sedan and they chopped that length, length out of the back end of the vehicle. So it has sort of a, a, a tighter appearance to it, which I think gives it a sportier stance. What's your take, Sean? Yeah, I, I have to say... I have to see it in person. Um, number one, it it's not what I wanted from the hatchback, but I like it still. Like that's kind of how I feel about it. I was hoping for something a little bit more upright again. I'm thinking, you know, like an EG hatch, you know, from the '90s or something. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is just 
uh, kind of wasn't expecting them to go this route, but it's not bad. You know, like it's just a much more handsome is maybe the right word I want to use take on it. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think it looks really good. Uh, but I, I still think like there's something about the current hatchback that will soon be going away. It kind of has this like, oh, you know, that's a Japanese car. Like it looks like a Gundam kind of style to huh. it. It's all like chiseled at the rear and stuff. And it's a little weird busy, looking, but it is weird looking, but I kind of like it too. So I don't know. I don't know which one I like better. I'm not sure, but the interior on this one w blows it away by a million miles. Oh yeah. Same story as the Civic sedan. You get uh, that lower, more horizontal dashboard, which looks much more adult than what is offered in the current, or I should say outgoing Civic. Uh, you get that nifty mesh texture that runs across the dashboard. Uh, I imagine it's a bit difficult to clean, so keep a can of compressed air in your glove box, but it also <laughs> hides the air vents, so which you control with little joysticks, as you can see there. Pretty neat feature. Uh, other than that, uh, basically the same as the Civic Sedan. The, the wheelbase is a little, a little bit longer. The rear track is wider. Uh, the structure is stiffer, and the car should have better outward visibility than before. Also, under the hood, expect exactly the same powertrains. Two-liter naturally aspirated four is the base engine with 158 horsepower, or you can get 1.5 turbo if you want a little bit more oomph in the higher end versions of the car with 180 horsepower. But the big powertrain news, the most important powertrain news is the transmission because the CVT There's is a offered, stick shift. but yes, a six speed manual. You can get it with either one of the engines. Um, so that is super exciting. Now I know nobody's going to buy them. We, we cheer that because I it's awesome and fun and we love cars. <laughs> Uh, but I realistically know that like, uh, you know, 90, let's say 97% of Civic Hatch buyers will just go with the CVT, which hurts me. Yeah, that sounds about right. What can you do? What can you do? <laughs> that so, sounds about right. But, yeah. Uh, that wasn't the only the new debut Hatch. this week. No, no, it was not. Uh, but Civic no, Hatch will not. be and available I, yes. later this year, I was just going to say, but that was as specific yes. as Honda was. So Maybe yes. I saw rumors of something leaked, maybe September, somewhere in there. But later this year is all they're officially saying. So sorry, Sean, yeah. go ahead. Another new too... product. No, no, no. I was just going to say, didn't we got, we have to tell people when they can see it at dealerships. So that's my bad. <laughs> but yeah. uh, no, the other new bigger thing, literally bigger, because it has three rows of seats, yes. was the Infinity QX60. This is the 2022 redesigned QX60. And uh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a box of tissue on the counter. There it is. It just yeah, sits there. I, I, I think it's, I will say, number one, huge step forward. Like much, 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 much better, especially inside. Let's it's hear the bad news. Bland. It's just kind of <laughs> bland. It's so like, here's the thing, is I think they're trying to go for that like, uh, we're not performance luxury. We're not BMW. You know, we're not even Mercedes Benz. We're we're like the Lincoln or the Buick or the Cadillac you bought in the '80s yeah. or the '90s. Like we're soft, we're comfortable, we're approachable. That's smart because you know who else is doing that? Lincoln. But Lincoln mm -hmm. designers kind of got it going on because the current mm -hmm. vehicles and upcoming ones look really good. This doesn't look bad, but there's still something just kind of like it it doesn't grab your attention enough for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I looked at some photos quickly and I'm just like, eh, it's fine. I, I don't mind it. Yeah. But uh, apparently it's built on this basically the same architecture as the outgoing Pathfinder and QX60. So most of the underpinnings should be the same, like the same bones, uh, although the wheelbase uh, is the same, but it's about 1.4 inches shorter overall. So they did change the body length a little bit, uh, but not like the fundamentals, which is kind of weird. You would think they would have gone with some new architecture, but that costs a lot of money. So they didn't. It does. It does. Though the big thing they did swap out was the CVT is gone. And now that yes. V6 engine, which is also carryover, is now paired with a nine speed automatic. So that yes, that's good. That 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 should be better than the CVT, uh, at least on paper. And you know, just kind of, you know, for a luxury vehicle, like 
I don't know. I don't want a CVT. Uh, that just, I don't know, doesn't really mix well for me, but uh, it can tow up to 6,000 pounds. That's a thousand more than before, even though there's still that 3.5 liter V6 with 295 horsepower and 270 pound feet of torque. Uh, and overall, the bigger changes are kind of inside because gone is that dual screen setup that I don't think anybody actually liked. <laughs> um <laughs> And instead, nope. there's the there's that tablet style screen, which is becoming uh, quickly the norm. Uh, that's a 12.3 inch touch screen. And then for the driver, there's another 12.3 inch screen there. But that's for the uh, the gauge cluster. Uh, and then if mm -hmm. you'd like, there's a 10.8 inch head up display that'll put all sorts of junk all over your windshield to look at. <laughs> and a bunch of other tech, yada, yada, blah, yes. blah, blah. Yeah. We got a couple comments in the chat room. Folks were asking about the transmission, uh, but we answered that just a minute ago. Arthur says, Infinity lost its character a little bit starting in the 2015 to 2016 timeframe because of having the VR30 DDTT. So I guess he's referring to the twin turbo V6 engine. Mm -hmm. So, which is a lovely little engine, which would have been great mm -hmm. in this vehicle, but they stuck with the carryover 3.5. Hmm. Yeah. Probably because it was already engineered to fit in the existing platform. <laughs> and money. <laughs> yes, and and money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so money is important. But the new QX60 yes. should go on sale late this year, but unfortunately no official pricing information available just yet. Yes, but there's another big vehicle coming, and we're swapping to it now. Literally and figuratively. Yes. It is the new Toyota Tundra. It was not revealed, <laughs> but we already saw one exterior photo. But they gave us a glimpse at the interior, Craig. They did. They certainly did. Um, and when we say glimpse, we mean it's yes. a glimpse because there's about like a 16th of it showing. <laughs> Most of it is this yeah, lovely like this... photoshopped thing you're looking at. <laughs> Yeah, this is what they gave, literally what was available on the media site. This is what Toyota released, which is points for, you know, they're trying to be coy and, and trying to build excitement. So everybody wrote about it, right? Everybody has a post on the Tundra, I'm making air quotes, teaser photo that was released, even though it shows you basically nothing. Um, yeah. So points to their PR department for that. Um, but yeah, they're trying to build uh, some hype for the new Tundra. Uh, and I think it's working. Oh it's, yeah. Uh, I, we, I, th this was, a uh, every time we've talked about Tundra on the roadshow.com, people are flocking to it. They clearly like Toyota trucks, uh, Tacoma and Tundra. The Tundra's super old. So is the Tacoma. Uh, there is a new Tacoma coming, uh, but the Tundra, I guess gets to go first. And, uh, yeah, it's it's much overdue. So I'm sure all of these hardcore Toyota Tundra fans are like dying to get <laughs> a new truck. Something something that wasn't engineered in the Pleistocene era. Yes. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, if we pull that, there are we can glean some information about this new Tundra uh, from that teaser photo. So Evan, if you can throw that back up on screen for a second, or or there we go. There's a professional ah. artist rendering. Yes, that is what uh, the rest of the Tundra interior will look like. Yeah, Maybe. we paid our it we has... paid our our uh, our expert artist a lot of money, guys, to put this together so that you guys could see this interior early. So you need to be appreciative I mean, and thankful. This is a this is a, yes, and this is a photorealistic sketch. But um, oh, yeah. in the original that Toyota released, we can see a few things. Uh, the truck will have a steering wheel, for instance. Uh, the roof is supported <laughs> by a couple of A pillars. Um, huh. The dashboard, there is a dashboard as well. Yeah. I think the rear view mirror will be standard equipment, though it may be optional. We'll have to find out. And yeah. then really the only big thing that we can tell uh, is the availability of a gigantic touch screen uh, in the middle. It looks like it's probably 10 or 12 inches, but we can't tell for sure based on the photo, but it's going to be big. So that's yeah. pretty much in vogue these days. Yes. It should get and, a pretty yeah. big heaping helping of uh, technology inside since the current truck is kind of uh, crawling along with some 
older technology. But hey, at the same time, there's people who don't want all that stuff, especially in their truck, you know, so that could also yeah. make the Tundra very, very appealing. You know, I, I could definitely see that side if someone was like, well, I don't want all of that. You know, I, I understand that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we had talked about, there was a teaser last week when you were gone, Sean, about uh, the Tundra's engine. Supposedly, mm-hmm. we're estimating it's going to be a three and a half liter V6 with twin turbos, of course. So this week we get a glimpse at the interior. Maybe next week Toyota will release a little letterboxed image of the bed or something so we can get an <laughs> idea of what that's going to look like. Yeah, or like you'll do like a like a picture puzzle thing where they're just going to give us random photos and then you put the interior together. Oh, they'll yes. Mail, yes uh, they'll, they'll mail it to your house. And then if you put it together first, you get, I don't know, a bagel. I don't know. It's the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. A snack. I a wouldn't cookie. turn that down. A, yeah. A Toyota cookie or something. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. um, other truck news though is pretty important. Uh, mail trucks, supposedly new mail trucks are in the work for the United yes. States postal service. Uh, it sounds yeah, like fi- finally, right? So Oshkosh, I understand, is going to build a new factory in Spartanburg, South Carolina, to make new mail trucks. Uh, they're probably going to need around a thousand people in the f- in the plant to do that. And you can see the very frumpy, although I'm sure extremely functional, uh, new mail truck <laughs> design. Very unusual proportions, but again, a specialized vehicle, so you can't expect it to look like a normal car. Um, uh, yeah, but it's it's a pretty important news because these are supposedly going to be electric, but also offer very fuel efficient combustion engines, which we hear we're going to be uh, both powertrains will be provided by Ford, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, so that should uh, really clean up, clean up the postal service. eh? Yeah, yeah, it, it's weird. Uh, you know, the USPS took like six years to announce a winner. They, they asked for they did like a request for proposal back in like 2014, 2015. And they, this year selected Oshkosh uh, to build the truck. The early prototype that Oshkosh, um, you know, put out there was a Ford transit. So like Ford had something to do with it. And then I asked Ford when Oshkosh won the contract and they said, we have nothing to do with it. Okay. (laughs) And then this week they're like, we're going to supply power chain trains. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's pretty big. That's a heck of a contract for, for Ford, you know, for, uh, perhaps a couple hundred thousand new vehicles that are going to be running Ford, you know, batteries or and engines. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that, that's pretty big on their part. Yeah. So very good news. Uh, at least, um, uh, again, for Ford with the powertrains and everything, uh, Oshkosh, it sounds like has a contract. To, to build these for 10 years, something I think up to 165,000 units, because you obviously don't need that many every single year, but it's going to be a slow and steady right. trickle of vehicles. And production is set to kick off in the summer of 2023. So two more years from now, which is forever, yeah, I think, it seems. Yeah, it is. I think part of that is they're taking an old warehouse actually in South Carolina, and they're going to basically like gut it and then bring in like the manufacturing stuff that they need. So it sounds like they need some time to get that all put together before they start building the trucks. Um, And also along the way, we really don't know what's going to happen with the powertrains because uh, Congress is kind of asking like, why aren't all of them going to be electric? You know, at one point the USPS Mm -hmm. is like, well, only a, a sliver of them are going to be electric when that kind of, you know, wasn't supposed to be the plan. So who knows? You know, we don't we don't know what's going to happen with all of them. But nevertheless, Ford engines, transmissions, and Ford electric powertrains will be in there when they do hit the road. Nice. Uh, Eric Mercado in the YouTube chat says the design seems off putting, though. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It's very tall. The hood is very low. It looks kind of frumpy. I, I- but again, this is I mean, a form <laughs> follows function design. 100%. And also, like, really, is the long life vehicle a sexy object today? No. So I think this is a fitting no. successor. <laughs> exactly. Arthur Wall says, also, they should throw the 2.7 liter EcoBoost in the mail trucks. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> as funny as as hilarious as that would be. <laughs> That's how you speed up delivery times. That person is yes. thinking. 
Yes, it's not, and and you 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 know you don't uh, crush the mail sorting machines, but that's another story. Um, but yeah, two point seven liter EcoBoost would be hilariously fun in in a mail truck. I mean, it, it that engine yeah. hauls backside in like a full size F one fifty. So in something much smaller and lighter, it would really move. Um, oh, but yeah. opposite of small and light, last story, we got to touch on this really quickly. I thought it was super cool. Uh, GM is partnering with a company called Wobtech. Uh, Wobtech makes uh, trains, makes uh, locomotives, basically. And uh, GM will be supplying its Altium battery technology to Wobtech for making electric trains, which is a great way to uh, decarbonize uh, transport, you know? Trains burn diesel oftentimes, and it's not very clean. And uh, by switching to electric, you can make significant reductions in emissions and what would be fuel consumption. Uh, so this is some footage of their FLX or flex drive uh, locomotive. Um, it features 18,000 lithium ion battery cells. It's supposedly the world's first battery powered, 100% battery powered locomotive. And it's packed with some 2.4 megawatts of power. And you thought the Tesla Model S Plaid had big batteries. Uh-uh. This Wobtech uh, flex drive beats it by a little bit. Um, yeah. So that gives you 350 miles of range towing a freaking train uh, and a top speed of about 27, or, pardon me, 75 miles per hour. Which is pretty damn impressive. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a big vehicle you got to provide propulsion to so that that's not too bad honestly and i mean battery tech like let's be honest it's in its infancy still <laughs> yeah yeah but uh it sounds like a switch potentially to ultium technology could significantly help improve the range of this uh this train uh they have so far tested it for more than thirteen thousand three hundred miles uh of what they call revenue service in California's San Joaquin uh, Valley area, which is supposedly pretty hilly. The train, uh, as far as I can tell, performed very well. Um, and just like a Prius or any other electric car or hybrid, it features regenerative braking. So you can recharge the battery when you're going downhill to use that to come up and climb the next hill. Uh, and then of course uh, you recharge it in the rail yard uh, when it's not being used. So. Yeah, that's uh, pretty cool. And they claim a, an 11% cons reduction in consumption and emissions with the 2.4 megawatt hour uh, model. But if they switch to a 6 megawatt hour model, which it sounds like they're developing, uh, they could see it could be 30% more efficient, which is a huge increase. So wow, car the car what industry isn't the next? only one to clean up. I know, right? But it's good to see like... The automotive industry gets dumped on, it seems like, for so many, for for bearing an unfair burden of cleaning up emissions, right? Because, and I'm all for clean air, don't get me wrong, not at all. I don't want to live in smoggy <laughs> California or something in the 70s, right? That's awful. Clean air is important. A clean environment is important. But like when everything you manufacture is in China and it's put on a boat that basically burns tar to ship it over to like America or Europe or wherever else, that's that's terrible for the environment. <laughs> yeah, and why no, can't I, we I, clean I up some argument. of those things? Yeah, clean up some of these other transportation alternatives, including trains, so that the automotive industry isn't the only one that has to bear the burden. Right? It seems reasonable to me. Right? Seems it does. It does seem reasonable. Yeah. Why can't totally we have fair. electric Come on. trains? Gosh darn it! Well, <laughs> they are working on it. So, Sean, that was our last story for the, the show this week. And as much as I would like to keep chatting, I would also like to start my weekend because, again, it is Friday. Yes, it is Friday. Here we go. Let's let's just, like, fly into the weekend. Let's get out of here. Let's do this. So, glad you could join us again, Sean. And, of course, we owe a back-slapping thank you to Evan Miller, video producer extraordinaire, e-bike enthusiast, bathtub safety advocate and amateur ornithologist evan you do a lot thank you so much <laughs> oh there he is he's not there looking he so good <laughs> he needs evan. the weekend bad <laughs> he, he died this week literally <laughs> and of course oh. thank you so very much for watching roadshow news recap where we dissect and discuss the most important car related stories of the past week you can join us for the live broadcast nearly every Friday. 
right here on the Roadshow YouTube channel or on Facebook or on Switch. Just tune in around 3 p.m. Eastern. That's every single Friday. And with that, we are done here. Y'all have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.